Hi. Good morning, everybody, uh, and members of the public. We're 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 going to have an interesting morning. The entire morning is going to be spent on housing issues in Vermont. And today is sort of an introduction, though this committee doesn't need much of an introduction to the housing problem, issue, crisis, whatever you want to call it, um, in the state of Vermont. And we've assembled some of the leaders in housing throughout the state, uh, from developers to planners to nonprofits. Uh, and we're going to sort of, as I've explained to the committee, where we have a lot of housing bills that are either in our committee or are coming to our committee. Uh, they cover the waterfront, and my intention and the committee like the idea of putting together an omnibus housing bill. We don't know exactly what the vehicle is, but I hope it'll be a committee bill. Uh, but this is the first of many hearings on housing, but we want to hear from these witnesses um, you know, how they view the housing problem in Vermont and any solutions uh that that are in the works right now or new ideas or creative ideas from uh land use planning um to subsidy programs but i don't want to go into subsidy programs that much that are in play already uh because the appropriations committee will be dealing with that as well as our committee and this hearing is not so much about money as new policy ideas. Uh, obviously money is always the, the big sweetener here and is key, but uh, I think there's a lot of things we might do and borrow from other states or jurisdictions in terms of ideas to make housing less expensive to build, uh, build quicker and consistent with smart growth policies. Um, so we have a lot of uh, important folks here who, who have worked in Vermont for a long time and know the lay of the land. So um, our first witness, uh, Scott, did I miss an email where Josh can't be present till a certain time? He can be here at 10 o'clock this morning, sir. Okay. Well, we're gonna, uh, probably not surprising, start off with Chris Cochran. We like to start off with the administration first in terms of getting uh, some background in terms of uh, getting what they see on the horizon and then we'll move on to each other. And the format is that everybody will have about 10 minutes or a little bit more, but um, feel free if you have a comment that you think is especially pertinent to other people's testimony to raise your hand. And we may have a little dialogue before we leave that person. But other than that, uh, I don't know whether we will have time at the end to do more of a round table thing, but we will hopefully either have you back or some of the people you work with back because we're gonna be dealing with this issue and this potential bill for mm -hmm. the rest of the month at least. Uh, so with that, said, unless anybody, any committee members have any questions, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Cochran. Um, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Chris Cochran. I'm the Director of Community Planning and Revitalization, and I work for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And I'm pleased to say I have one of the best jobs in state government. Um, we've been working for many years um, with our partners to figure out ways we can align our policies, regulations, and programs to support compact development in our centers. Um, as you know, kind of most recently, we've been working with this committee on S-101, which was a bill that made several changes um, to support smart growth. Um, one of the things that um, we're soon to announce is the bylaw modernization grants um, that helps municipalities um, create zoning, um, create opportunities for new housing within their you know, sewer and water areas, service areas in their smart growth locations. Um, ACC is gonna send out an announcement today, a press release announcing the 41 grant winners 
It was a $500,000 investment. I think it's going to really make a big, big difference in many of our communities. And I want to thank the community, the committee for their leadership on this. Um, I do believe the press release has a soundbite from the chair. So thank you for that. Um, I, I think continuing work like that is really important, um, kind of getting communities engaged locally and how they can become, you know, how they can find local housing solutions and make it easier to develop is, is key. I hope we can continue this um, into the next year. Um, I guess we'll find out more about that when the governor gives his budget address, but I, I'm hopeful at this point. Um, the other thing that was in S101 that I hope we can continue working on was a expansion of the downtown and village center tax credits to neighborhood areas. Um, without getting into the weeds, the neighborhood designation essentially does a lot of the bylaw modernization grants through a different through a designation framework. Um, the bylaw grants in conjunction with a, a tax incentive to improve housing, I think will help even more communities create um, smart growth redevelopment opportunities within their centers. Um, the last thing, you know, uh, one of the things that we do is and is try to figure out how we can identify areas where there's overlap between state and local regulation and, and try to minimize those overlaps. And one of the things in 101 that we'd like to um, see if we can get past this year is the elimination of the duplication of the, of the state and local water, connect, water and wastewater connection permits. Um, the House pushed back on that, took it out, but I think, you know, I hope those conversations will continue. Um, but it's, you know, it's one of many examples of overlap. Um, some may disagree with this, but I mean, I think Act 250 in our centers is a bit of a duplication of permitting. Um, and we'd like to see opportunities to allow communities to permit larger scale housing developments within our centers. We need the housing, it's the right location. And we've been working uh, over the summer and fall with Representative Bongarts on the House um, on a bill called H511. It does several things, um, including Act 250 exemption for centers. Um, it makes the, the neighborhood designation, I think, a little bit easier for our smaller communities to achieve. Um, I think that in conjunction, if we can continue the bylaw grants, we'll ensure that we get more communities in the neighborhood designation program. That with tax credits, I think, will, will, will really make a difference over time. And, and you know, these are not quick changes. They're not going to happen overnight. Um, but these are slow incremental changes that will really, really, really make a difference. Um, have you gone over 511 at all in your committee? We have not. Would it be helpful if I just hit the highlights or, or do you want to wait? Um, the ones, yeah, the ones that deal with uh, the goal here of making housing mm -hmm. quicker to build and more, uh, less costly to build. Yes. Yeah. All right, so there's there's just a there's several it's like this is small incremental changes but meaningful changes. It takes existing provisions, our our designation framework, and makes it easier. It uses um, it expands an existing um, Act 250 benefit for designated centers called priority housing projects. These are certain mixed use affordable housing developments located within centers. Um, it expands the threshold and allows smaller communities to participate in a more equal way. It essentially, I, I know it's a kind of a loaded word, but it, you know, it changes the Act 250 jurisdiction within these areas. So larger projects, projects of you know, 20, 30, 40 units um, can be approved locally without an additional Act 250 permit. Um, so I think that will, <clears throat> will be a big help, especially with the huge investment we're seeing you know, from the federal level. Um, that's, we want to that's not the case now. There's a limit on the um, size of so the housing. There, there are tiers. So right now, larger communities, um, like in your region, Senator um, Burlington, has no cap on the exam on on the number of units that they can build. So City Place, for example, was a very large, you know, nearly nearly 500 units um, did not need to get an Act 250 permit because they had a certain amount of affordable housing and they qualified as a priority housing project. In smaller communities, the cap right now is at 25 units. And we've heard from our partners, I think VHFA did a study looking at kind of where the sweet spot is for development. You know, and I think it's around 30 to 40 units, um, you know, where you kind of get the right max, you know, the right benefit for like scale um, to make the housing more affordable. 
And with a 25 unit threshold, it, it's harder for smaller communities to participate in that. I think there was a recent example in um, South Hero. You know, the, the community really wanted to, to get the neighborhood designation to support the ho affordable housing development. The unit cap was too low. It wasn't going to benefit them. I think it did ultimately get built, but it had to go, you know, through Act 250. Um, so we'd like to raise those thresholds in that bill. So I have a, an, an analogous question. Um, when you talk about uh, increasing the credits, uh, my understanding is there will be a proposal to increase the credits and I assume also expand the breadth of the credits. Is there any kind of requirement or a priority to the application for credits that have housing development within the application or can you get downtown credits for projects that have no housing increase? Um, right now, there's no um, priority or preference for housing. Um, um, and we, that said, we do a lot of, we do support a lot of affordable housing development within centers. A little bit is, you know, it's, it is a decent mix every year and I'd be happy to share the, the numbers. Um, um, a little bit of it, I think, you know, tends to go to more commercial development and this is due largely to the designation and how they're constructed. The, the downtowns and village centers are really only looking at the commercial core of the community and not so much of the housing that surrounds the communities. I think by ex the proposal to expand and enlarge the area to the neighborhoods that surround the commercial cores um, will naturally increase the investment in housing because more housing units would be eligible for the tax credits. Um, uh, do you want to mention a couple of more things in, in uh, Representative Bongart's bill and then we'll move yeah. on to Christine um, Harp? Um, the other thing too is, um, you know, we spent a lot of time this summer, um, ACCD on the Vermont Climate Council. Um, and, you know, we're looking at ways to make our, our downtowns and village centers also more resilient um, while also supporting kind of safe infill within these areas. Um, right now, there's an exclusion that says you can't infill any in any location located within a river corridor. Um, this policy is not consistent with ANR's policy that does allow infill within centers. Um, so we want to make a change to allow appropriate safe infill within these centers. Um, so that's one provision that we'd like to see. And, and I think the Natural Resources Committee is supportive of that. Re related to that is a something that the Senate passed, this committee passed before was a tax credit to provide um, um, an incentive for flood proofing these buildings um, within our downtowns. You know, our downtowns and village centers historically were built on water because water was a source of power or transportation. They're not going to be moving anytime soon. Um, so we wanna make sure that while, when buildings are being improved, that they take the steps um, to, to flood proof these buildings. So when, when, when a flood does happen and it will happen again, that these businesses can bounce back more quickly or, or people's lives are not as devastated as they could be. Um, I just have one more question, Chris. Uh, is there anything out there from past few years that we try to aspire to in terms of legislation that fell by the wayside that you think that we might want to revisit uh, and specifically on bylaw modernization are you very happy with the way things are going? I mean, we wanted to do more of a mandate than a carrot approach or a technical assistance approach, but we got what we could get and it seems to be working, but should we revisit that as well? Yeah, I, um, and I think you're making a reference to a bill from 2020, which was S-237, um, which I think got some good ideas out there. Ultimately, a lot of it didn't pass the house, but um, I think taking another look at, um, some of the exclusive single family zoning um, in, our, in our communities may be worthy of a conversation. I think you wanna make sure that it's targeted at um, areas with sewer and water, because otherwise it, it has a potential to, you know, encourage sprawl if you say um, single family, you know, is banned everywhere. Um, and I think you might get some pushback, but I think that's something worthy of additional conversation. And, and I think we, could, we would like to work with you on that. Okay. so. Um... Senator Clarkson has a question, but yes, after each witness is finished or even in the middle of testimony, if you want, 
raise your hand and uh, you can ask a question. Uh, Senator Clarkson. Thank you. Good morning. It's so good to see so many of you champions of housing. Um, the uh, Chris, I would I wonder if we might tie the expansion uh, to the downtown cre tax credits to housing, sort of building on Michael's question, but specifically it, it, the expansion, because we've been looking for an expansion for, as you know, several years now, really since Paul's death, as I think the first time we really wanted to establish a much more significant uh, downtown tax credit opportunity. Um, and, and maybe to build on Michael's question, we could uh, tie the uh, expansion of it to housing, or at least have that as a, as a priority within that expansion. Yeah, I'd, I'd be open to, to talking further about that. Um, I think the challenge is, is we don't know what the applicant pool will be every year. And I'd hate to just kind of tie the board's hands, you know, um, but um, we could also, I mean, you could do it any number of ways. I'd be open to like a directive to like, you know, from in, in statute to give priority consideration to housing, but just as long as it wasn't like too explicit, because um, we want to be able to support um, lots of different good projects and the mix and the needs on community is going to vary. Thanks. Food for thought. Okay. Um, let's move on. Thank you, Chris. I hope you can stay with us. Uh, Christine, are you with us? Yes, there you are. Good morning, Christine. Good morning. I'm not getting the best audio. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, we can. Thank you, Becky. Good morning, and thank you very much for having me and allowing me to participate in this very important uh, roundtable. A little about my background. Uh, for, I came to Vermont 43 years ago to serve as Brattleboro's assistant town manager and planner, and I've worked in the housing field my whole career. I was executive director of the Brattleboro Housing Partnerships which is also the housing authority for Brattleboro for 24 years. I stepped aside two years ago to focus on two development projects for BHP. I served for 10 years on the Vermont Housing yeah. Conservation Board and three years as its chair. I've served on many other local and statewide planning and housing groups. I currently I'm a member of the Tri-Park Mobile Home Community Association on its board and on its Master Redevelopment Committee. So with this background, I will address your request. The first and most important area to be addressed in Vermont is its public housing. Yes, we have it and we have a fair amount of it. Much of it was built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It can be very worn out and dis despite the best efforts of the housing authorities. As VHCB developed the housing trust model for new lower income and subsidized housing development, public housing for many reasons was not included. At one point, there was a notion that the federal government should step up and take care of its public housing. I could not agree more with that. However, that is exactly what did not happen. A study of the backlog of needed capital improvements in public housing throughout the country six years ago found a backlog of $36 billion. I did a study of the Brattleboro Housing Partnership and found that at one time we had a capital, an essential capital improvement need of over $9 million. We received $350,000 a year to address our essential capital needs. As a state, we are now the recipients of significant federal dollars for housing and I strongly advocate that some of these funds be directed to public housing. I believe Vermont never intended to have two classes of housing 
for the very low and low income. One done by the nonprofits that gets a substantial upgrade every 15 years. And the other, the federal public housing, which is still dealing with original cabinets built in the 80s and incredibly inefficient heating systems as well as others. In some cases, this housing really should be removed and in its place, new housing that meets the standards of 2022. We could easily double or triple the density on these sites and have new neighborhoods in or near the downtowns where many of these are located with a mix of income and ages. Most public housing authorities are staffed for property management. So taking on this challenge is going to be very difficult. I would just say that one of the things that I've done is the development of four um, different developments. Uh, we did them with uh, Nancy Owens and Evernorth. So I see the difference and our residents see the difference. And our residents say to us, how come I live at blank, 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 that is so old and so worn out and they get to live at Red Clover Commons, which is so nice and so new and has all the, all the basic amenities that people need. And we need, whether they're low income or not, but these are, are low, very low income people. And they're sitting there going, how can we have two different standards? We don't mean to in Vermont. I know we don't mean to have that, but that's what's happened. So most public housing authorities are really not staffed for development. There are some that have done development and mine was one of them. And they've done good work, I would say, modestly. <laughs> so here's my recommendation. I would like to see Gus VHCB tasked with development of a program that focused on working with housing authorities to redevelop Vermont's public housing. Let's use this opportunity to have all of Vermont subsidized housing at the same standard, not some still using systems and furnishings from the 70s or 80s while many others are at 2022. This can result in more housing and even the quality of our, and even the, the quality of the subsidized housing in our state. So that's my first idea. And I'd really like, I'd love to see it happen. And I think what the state gets out of it is better and more housing. I know we can put greater densities on many of these sites and we can change the mix of people because when all this public housing was built, it was restricted, families or seniors and the disabled. We can now get away from that and put up really nice mixed age, mixed income housing. And that would be near our village and downtown centers. Going on, I was a founding member of SASH and the Barbara Housing Partnerships serves as the designated regional housing organization for Wyndham and Windsor counties. And it is now one of the pilot sites for family SASH. While at BHP, we created a resident wellness and services team Burlington Housing Authority is the only other example I am aware of in the state among its subsidized housing agencies that has a comprehensive team of people to deliver wellness and services coordination to residents. And I could be wrong, I'm, I'm just not up to date. Our team includes our three SASH coordinators, a resident services coordinator, which we fund, an education and employment coordinator, and the property management team. They meet weekly and have become an integral and essential part of how BHP carries out its housing mission. Let me give you one example. When we started this group, 
the first task that I gave them was to address our chronic rent payment problem in family housing. It hovered at 55 to 65% per month. So this was their first task and they were quite skeptical, but they did it. And when their program was in place, we now saw rent collection in these same places at 85 to 95% per month. I am not making that up. The reason was that among the interventions that they put in place was that when there was a non-payment of rent, the household was called by a service team member, not the property manager. The service team member could problem solve with the resident and often direct them to outside resources that would be of assistance to them. I believe this and the SASH model demonstrate that housing entities can have supportive service coordinators and that it brings the service connection as close as possible to those who need it. We do, we have always struggled with the gap between the wonderful services that we have and the people that need them. And this and SASH just make that gap smaller. We need to let go of the concept that housers cannot or should not be involved in services. We have demonstrated that this is not true and that it can work and that it actually is really beneficial to the resident. Another area along this line is the mandate that tax credit recipients commit to a certain number of units for the homeless or almost homeless or at risk. So the housing authorities have always housed the hardest to house and often the homeless. So we, we sort of understand that population, it's what we do. This policy has called on the nonprofit housing agencies to take this population and I know that it has not been a smooth transition. This is pre-COVID, but the nonprofit agencies were reporting higher numbers in eviction and issues of lease enforcement. It doesn't mean we should do away with that policy. I think that what we need to do is to recognize that the entities, that the agencies at the local level that bring the homeless and the hard to house to the housers and advocate for them and get them into housing, then do not have the resources to come back when that person has an issue. And they will most of the time. And the housing entity, if it doesn't have a service system like ours, calls on that local resource and often has been told, sorry, we don't have the funding we don't have the human or financial resources to cycle back to that person and help them help with you stay in their housing. So there is a substantial need for these agencies to be able to assist clients after they obtain housing. I agree that VHCB funds are housing funds and should not be allocated to this. They should be allocated to housing. But I would strongly recommend that local agencies working on housing the homeless and the hard to house have funding to ensure that they can respond when they are needed to keep someone in housing. Housing the homeless and hard to house is what we should be doing. However, if this results in more homelessness, then it is not a successful policy. Keeping people in housing must be as important as getting people housed to begin with. Almost done. The last area I'd like to mention is that of our mobile home parks. We must support them in every way we can. They are often, they often are community associations 
subject to turnover on the board and staff and the desire to never have lot rent increases. Yet they provide very essential housing. After many years, the Tri-Park Community Association in Brattleboro is now addressing its prolonged need for new sewer lines, bridges, and removal of homes that are right next to the brook and they flood at the smallest increase in water. It has not been easy to get to this point, but it has been very worthwhile and worth the effort and worth the effort to fund and continue. And I applaud the state agencies, uh, the two I know of are VHCB and community development that have continuously figured out how to finance and refinance loans and programs to keep the master plan project for TriPart going and to ensure that TriPart um, stays a community association. The only alternative TriPark has is to be bought out by some private or nonprofit, probably a private company. So it's very important. It's housing that we need to keep. It's worth the effort and we should support and continue it. So those are my great ideas for today. Thank you, Thank you Christine. I, uh, one question. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Christine? Can anybody hear me? Okay. Chair, I can hear you. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Christine. But I'm not sure Christine is hearing you. Yeah, I'm not. Oh, okay. I didn't hear it. Oh, you don't hear me. I hear you now. Okay, okay great. So my, my question is, um, again, and by way of reiterating where we're going, hopefully, is to produce more cost-effective, less expensive, more housing. And I was interested in your concept of maybe renovating or replacing existing public housing units with more more units on the same location, let's say. Uh, obviously, if you're just renovating, it's going to be on the same location. Uh, is, is it, uh, does that save money in producing more units as far as you're concerned? Uh, the fact that you're dealing with an existing structure, maybe that's already permitted or do you have to repermit it for additional units? Uh, I'm intrigued with the idea whether we can use our existing public housing stock and maybe turn it into denser housing or more modern housing and you said even mixed income housing. So it could be a win-win-win, but I don't know if that's realistic or not. Well, I think one of the places that you would find the savings is that the Public Housing Authority owns the land and it can be very expensive land because of its proximity to the downtown. Um, so that's a big help. Uh, for some of the cases that I'm thinking of, you would want to tear down the building. It's, it's just too old. I mean, it's really too old and it has not had the kinds of um, essential capital improvements that it's needed. Um, but then to put up a new building um, could be not inexpensive, but given how much development we've done in Vermont and frankly, how good we are at it, I think that we could uh, put it up on the public housing site and um, it, it, because we don't buy the land, it would help. Okay. And we could increase the density, which would also help a lot. Okay. Okay, so I did the math and it's about 12 minutes per witness. Uh, probably not even that much when we talk about questions, but um, so to the extent folks can keep their testimony to that, we, we have lots of opportunity to have you back to drill drill down deeper, but we want an overview of today of some creative ideas. I see the commissioner has joined us. Um, uh, I don't know if you have a, an idea of the flow of what we're after,
but you're usually pretty good at that. Uh, we're looking at uh, trying to hear new ideas, not necessarily monetary, more money for existing programs, but other ideas the administration may be thinking of or have looked at that can produce housing in a more dependable environment, uh, a less expensive permitting process, uh, quicker, uh, and just to get at the problem of our shortage of housing in the state of Vermont. And this is gonna be, we're looking at an omnibus bill down the road. So you'll be in this committee probably on a weekly basis talking about housing. So don't feel the need to go deep, but if you can give us an overview, that would be great. Sure, uh, thank you. Good morning, um, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Housing Community Development. Sorry, I missed the beginning um, uh, of this. I, well, one thing I wanna say is, you know, this committee, um, you know, has been very supportive of the sort of zoning land use changes that need to be made to make our housing development um, more responsive, you know, quicker, more affordable, and we need to do a lot more there. But I wanna thank um, you, Senator Schrocken. I think you'll see a press release this morning getting at that very thing about helping towns modernize their, their bylaws um, to be more pro-housing growth. I think that is the number one thing that Vermont needs to um, wrestle with and, and be comfortable with is we need to be pro-housing growth. And we haven't been for, for decades. Um, there's smart ways to do that. And we're getting at those by, you know, exempting areas from, you know, whether it's Act 250, encouraging towns to have, you know, allow more density and more creative housing solutions, infill, multi-unit on what would have been restricted to single family home, you know, zoning. All those aspects are foundational to what we need to do and shift towards to modernize and keep up with our housing demand. I think um, we're moving down that road. That's great. We need to move faster. I think the other piece um, is the market itself just isn't able to respond to the modest home construction that we need and we need to double down on. And it, it's time for government to incentivize that. It, it's been a sort of um, hands-off approach at this middle income housing level, you know, left up to the market. But the fact is we hear from developers, for-profit, non-profit of every stripe that they are having a hard time building homes at a, a rate that many working Vermont families can afford. And you know the, the price points are just increasing. And um, if we want more of those sort of entry level modest homes built, we're gonna need to do something to incentivize it because left to the market, they won't be produced. Um, we'll see more homes above $550,000 produced when we need homes at $350,000 produced, new homes. Um, you know, that's for the new development. We also have areas of the state that have sort of existing housing stock that needs incentives to rehab and, and put those back out. Um, those are expensive as well. There's a value gap there. When you look at the effort to buy even a foreclosed home, you know, great, you can get a great deal on a home for $140,000 but they need another $140,000 of investment to bring them up to current energy standards as required to you know, replace heating systems, windows, roof. It is very expensive. The challenge is when you're done with that investment, it's not gonna appraise for what you put into it. And folks like Nancy with Evernorth and others have experimented with this and they can tell you that it just costs more to put into these redevelopment projects of existing stock, then they will appraise at the end. So there is another place where government needs to in, uh, intervene and incentivize. Um, I don't wanna to take too much time because I don't have as much of a prepared testimony as others, but one area the governor's laser focused on is this missile in, missing middle income homeownership development. Um, the governor has a pilot program in the BAA and you know, without getting ahead of myself, I, I think you'll see more efforts in the budget um, for next year to focus on missing middle income homeownership uh, supply side incentives. It's not enough to increase homeownership um, down payment assistance in those efforts that are based on the, the buyer. The buyers are out competing each other. Those efforts left 
by themselves are just becoming less and less efficient and they're competing against each other when the supply doesn't exist. We have a scarcity problem. It's increasing cost um, unaffordability across the rental and the home ownership market. That is a disaster. You know, it's a recipe for more homelessness when people are paying more than 50% of their household income on, on housing. So we need supply slide solutions, um, all stripes, small home builders, large developers, for-profit, non-profit, um, all across the state. And we need a variety of, um, of, of sort of, I would say, paths to get this done. We, we have some traditional things in place, you know, like the shared equity program folks are familiar with, but we need new tools and we need to pilot things and see if they work. Um, we need to not be scared to try some new um, approaches here because what we've been doing the last 30 years clearly isn't keeping up with the need and the demands. And so we have to be a little entrepreneur here, entrepreneur um, spirit here and try some things and, and be okay with um, learning as we go. We've got these federal resources that are short time. Congress appropriated them to respond to the crisis and the recovery. And we can't sort of sit and wait to have every detail understood and answered before we launch anything because our, our housing crisis is growing by the day. And so I would just implore you to be also be willing to take some risk and um, address this need head on with lots of different uh, solutions um, and so I'll sort of stop there. If you have specific questions for me, I I'm happy to try to jump in. Well, that's music to my ears. I, I, I would love to hear, if maybe you can send us a memo in like the next week or so, nothing elaborate, like a page and a half with uh, bullet points of some of those ideas that uh, you don't have to say whether they're being proposed by the administration or not. Uh, but just a, a list of potential ideas where some incentives can be put on the supply side. Um, and we'll dig deeper into those. Uh, my intent is to take all ideas, put them in bill form, and then have the committee over a several week period go through that bill and make decisions as to whether they want it in or out, pilot basis or not, amended or not, uh, to work towards a committee bill, which its focus is pretty much precisely, uh, well, in large part, what, you, what you're talking about. Uh, so we, wanna, we want some new creative ideas of how to do it. I'm glad you mentioned shared equity because my, my thoughts went there originally, whether we can do more with that uh, on the homeowners side where they get incentives to get into housing, but on the end, product, they, they give back some of that money in terms of shared equity and keep the house affordable at the same time. So we, I know we have some programs like that already, but uh, maybe it can be tweaked. Uh, Senator, Senator, I could give you one specific example of, of something that's under construct um, consideration, uh, both uh, with VHCB and with VHFA and with lots of banks, credit unions and builders that is an example of one of the uh, ideas we need to, to, to move forward on is, you know, it's risky to take construction loans to build homes speculative that we haven't pre-sold yet. It's uh, the interest rates are going up and banks are afraid to take risk, especially after the 2008, you know, crisis, you know, pre-funding, um, um, you know, uh, condos and townhouses, you have to have those pre-sold. So, we are talking about a construction risk pool that um, allows us to you know, mitigate that risk. So um, construction loans to build more housing can have a, a lower interest rate and, and those um, financial institutions can take more risk to do more construction lending, which will help the entire industry, all types of, of building. And you know, we don't have to it, it, it's a small sort of match into a pool that can allow the market to work better to take um, on more uh, construction lending for um, home, home building. And, you know, we can um, put requirements around that, that this needs to be primary residences and so forth. But 
that's one example of what a lot of people are talking about that um, could benefit a broad spectrum spectrum of more home building in the state. So, Great. Senator, thank you. Senator Rom Kinsdale. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Senator Clarkson and I have a bill that's going to come out um, this week or next. I don't know how that works right now um, with a bill back up. But, um, you know, I, I hear you talking about middle middle income homeownership. Totally get it and agree. I think we're talking about a lot of working families who want to um, be oriented toward downtowns and transit as well. And as I've traveled, um, you know, to some of our, our smaller village centers and downtowns, um, they, they really wanna see incentives to help commercial buildings um, transition to residential build and the amenities and the safety, safety amenities that are needed to make that um, residential housing. I think that could happen. I, I'm not a developer myself, but you know, that is existing envelopes that you know, could be rehabbed potentially um, quickly. I know we're talking about doing this quickly. Um, you know, the other thing that we're proposing is trying to figure out if there's a way for the state to help get a match from some of our larger institutions, our hospitals, the folks that are, have a, a large contingent of working folks who literally can't take jobs in these institutions because they cannot find housing. And so I just wonder if you think those are creative ideas where we could set aside some money for really specific um, ideas that might leverage other dollars uh, as we think about our innovative ideas. Yes and yes. And one more, um, you know, we've heard from a lot of businesses about this same issue. They can't house their own employees. So they were talking about, can we build our own housing? And, you know, there's challenges with having employer owned housing because you're not only you're their landlord and their employer. So that's not really the best model. But what I'm hearing more from the business community um, is that they would convert some of these properties to housing. It, it, it's not as easy as you think, but the, the buildings are there. The infrastructure is there, the water, the sewer, the electricity, the broadband. The challenge is to quickly do that. We need an exemption for Act 250 because mm -hmm. if you eight or more units in any of those office buildings trigger Act 250 for a reuse, even though the resources have already been put into that property, it's in the perfect location. It could get stalled by a budding neighbors. It could get tied up. And so that is really, I think, um, where we need to come together as Vermonters and decide are our um, homes for people that are, you know, that, that need homes just as important as our sort of longstanding environmental, um, you know, uh, procedures. I, I, I'll just put it that simple that really for that money and that to be a quick solution, we need a fix for what gets in the way to convert perfectly good buildings in the right location to serve the needs of our future and not continue to be stuck in the past. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Josh. We'll be in touch and certainly have you back next week. I look forward to getting a, a, a short memo, uh, like a couple of sentences on each ideas, you know, that you've seen and you think we should explore whether the governor is putting money in or trying to establish as a pilot, just, this is a brainstorming session to come up with ideas and you're in the middle of all this. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, Senator Clarkson. Yes, and I look forward to next week. Maybe we'll hear something more about the construction risk pool and the uh, proposal for a construction risk pool. Okay. I mean, uh, in, in the budget address, um, <laughs> it would be great. Sounds like it may be in the Budget Adjustment Act, which we probably- Or in the, uh, yeah, either way. Got to look at already. Uh, so um, next we have Eric Farrell. Uh, uh, he comes from the same neck of the woods as I do. He's, he's appeared before the Development Review Board in South Burlington, in which I serve. So I've seen firsthand some of his frustrations <laughs> in terms of development and what the regulations and laws Put developers through, but I've also seen his end product of some really great projects. So I'm happy to have you here, Eric, and talk to us. Yes, I, I have to unmute to talk to you, right? <laughs> yeah, you have, you. you have to unmute. And, and, and is this your first time testifying 
with this committee? Because I don't think we've met. He, he testified on our road tour, I remember. Ah, right, right. I don't remember. I don't actually remember what I did yesterday, so I'm not sure. <laughs> so, so I did want to tell Christine, though, that I moved to Vermont 74 years ago. Not voluntarily, but, I, but I've been here all my life. So um, I agree. I don't have anything really profound to say, and I probably won't say anything you don't already know, but I agree with Josh that, it, it, that it's all about pro-housing growth, and it's, and it's all about supply, supply, supply. And uh, I don't, you know, I've chosen a different path for dealing with affordable housing because I've been partnering with Champlain Housing Trust and Cathedral Square and Housing Vermont for about 20 years because I, I, what I do best is take risks and what they do best is deliver affordable housing. And so I think any time, any, any, in any shape or form that you can deliver or support the nonprofit uh, housing efforts uh, and have them and allow them to, to partner with for-profit developers, I think that's a great model, at least in my experience. So um, I don't think there's, there's very little you can do to impact construction costs. I think construction costs are running right now. I, I build mostly multifamily housing. Construction costs are running around 15 or 18% higher than they were 18 months ago. It doesn't add a penny of value to the units that we deliver. Uh, it just costs more to build them. Um, and, and in rental housing, you know, rents are, are stronger than they were, but they don't come close to overcoming the increase, in, you know, in cost. Um, I think anything that you can do, like in Burlington, I do think the process is duplicative. I don't think that anything in the city of Burlington should be subject to Act 250. Probably the same for South Burlington and maybe other communities that I'm not familiar with that have anybody that has a sophisticated uh, uh, zoning and planning should not be subject to Act 250, in my opinion. Um, because the biggest obstacle or impediment to people doing the work that I do is the risks that we take. Um, a lot of people don't are not willing or able to take risks, and and I think that that. Um, is an impediment that you know, you know, to housing growth. Um, and, and an interesting thing about people sometimes will complain to me that the housing we build is new and it's expensive. And yes, it's more expensive than existing stock. But every time, if we if we build housing, the the our residents are not coming. For, they're not new residents to the community. They're just transitioning out of older stock. So if we, if we build a lot of new stock, it makes older stock available. The older stock is more affordable. So in a lot of ways, we're, we're helping to create um, uh, or distribute more affordable housing by building new stock, even though I can't afford to build new affordable housing, not at today's construction costs. Um, so the only way that I can help the affordability is to, is to partner with the nonprofits and to, and to build more supply. And I, and I think we could, if, if we doubled the amount of supply, we wouldn't catch up to the demand in 10 years, I don't think. I, I think it's impossible, it's almost impossible to catch up with demand. So um, an interesting thing that frustrates me is that, is that people who are, that show up at zoning hearings or planning hearings or Act 250 hearings and who are opposed to housing, you'll notice that they have one common characteristic. They already have housing. You don't see people showing up at these meetings who don't have housing. Renters don't show up complaining about me building out new housing. It's people who have housing and it, and it really, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very frustrating to hear that, uh, to, to see that happen. Um, so, so, sorry, I just need to interject. Uh, people need to mute if they aren't speaking. We're getting some weird background noise. In uh, the you're getting background noise from me because we're doing construction downstairs. Ah. And, and so I'm going to keep it brief and get off. And I apologize for that. But they're jackhammering the concrete floor to convert 7,000 feet of commercial space to more housing. So sorry about that. Um, Let's see, what else can I say? Uh, 
I, I, you know, I, I don't have anything more profound to say than that, other than then it's all about all about supply uh, and, and, and and supply in in the you know interestingly enough some people complain about the, the permitting costs the costs themselves the fees have very little my my developer friends will kill me for saying this but they don't really impact the cost of housing all that much you know yes we pay high fees but they they they, they don't have a whole lot of impact on the on the end result it's the time delays and the risks that are that are really the, 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 the factor so um so and and, I, and the last thing i will say is that density is the most archaic measure of, of development that ever existed uh, a lot of communities are moving to floor area ratios or uh form-based code um and so i th i think that uh, you know if, if every town got rid of density as a measure that would be a plus um, so I don't have anything more to say than that. I, I told um, Scott that I could be on from nine to 10. Then I got another commitment. I can come back on at 11, which I will do. Um, but uh, I probably haven't told you anything you haven't heard. So well, I just have one question before you go and then yes. we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Um, you say delay. I've also heard like uncertainty in the process is really a risk factor for developers. Um, you've highlighted Burlington and South Burlington as fairly sophisticated planning offices that may be duplicative and no, not a need for Act 250. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there, uh, do you have any handle on the rest of the state and uh, smaller communities, what we can do to help them get through the process quicker? And more certainty. I I really don't because I don't work in any. I mean, I ninety nine percent of my work is in Burlington, South Burlington, a little bit in Colchester. Uh, okay. So I, I don't really have any experience with the with smaller you know communities. But I will tell you, a lot of people don't do the work that I do because of the upfront costs, the uncertainty, and the risk, and and the potential for delay. You can shell out an enormous amount of money and be nowhere in two years. And that just stops people from even starting. Do you have uh, knowledge or experience as how Vermont compares to other states? Do you have developer friends in other states that say, I can't believe you have to go through all this in Vermont? Oh yeah, no, I, everybody that I, I don't know a lot of people from out of state, but but uh, people who, who uh, yeah, people tell me that I'm nuts to be doing business in Vermont. Okay. But, you know, but I, you know, and I, and I don't agree with them. I think I think Vermont is is the is the you know I, I'm never going to live anywhere but Vermont. I love I love working in in this community, but it's difficult. It's it's uh, it's not very developer you know friendly only because of the only because of the the risk. But I you know the, the, of course the other side of that is that if if you took off uh, all the constraints, then Vermont might uh, someday look like some other states that we don't want to have happen either. So it's, it's hard to find that balance between maintaining the quality of life that we have here, but also allow people, but also create more housing opportunities for people who want to come here. So. Right, Senator Collection. Thank you, Eric. I, I'm just curious if risk is one of the greatest factors and yet we have such huge housing need, how is, why is it so risky? I mean, it, I, I get the finances and I get delays, but risk when we have such huge housing need, I don't get that. I think that is like, you know, we're, we're, we're building for a very real need. And well, it, there's no question. I mean, if, if, if I build, there's a lot of demand, but yeah. you, can't, you can't finance the upfront costs. All the upfront costs are out of pocket. You can't borrow that. You can't, you know, when you option land and spend money on architects and engineers and permitting and everything else, all of that is out of pocket. And, and so, you know, some people don't want to take those risks for one, two, three years down the road or, or five years in the worst case. Uh, look at Macaulay Square. It took them five years in the Supreme Court to get a building permit. And I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars they had out of pocket before they got there. Right. But it, I, we also heard uh, previously that uh, there's a lot of pre-purchase with 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 things. Is that a way to mitigate some of that uh, risk for middle 
income in higher income housing? You mean, you mean pre-purchase, mean people buy something in advance? Yeah, uh, I've or buy an option advance. to buy in advance. Well, it's, but, but, that, but nobody's, nobody's going to put up at-risk money to do that. Right. They may put money in escrow, but I can't spend that money. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> it's, all, it's all out of pocket. And it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, I love the work that I do, and I think it's worth it, but it's, uh, but it's a heavy lift to get there. And so, so there's a lot fewer people do, doing what I do now than there were, you know, 20 years ago. So, Senator Clarkson, uh, one of the answers to your question, I think, simplistically put, some of these projects may not get permitted, and you don't know that. till So that's a risk, too. Uh, even though the demand's there, you may not get the permit, you may not have the housing, and you may have put up all yeah. this front, uh, front no, I, Right. I, I get that. I just, our demand is so high that it's, it's anyway. Right. Okay. I mean, I guess, there's, never, I guess, there's anything you can do to make it make it uh, assured uh i mean you can't guarantee you know you can't guarantee it you can't you can't just uh, all you know you yeah, we don't want it to be like houston where you can walk in to uh, to the office and, and walk out 90 minutes later with a permit for a 50 unit apartment building we don't want that either uh, but so um, um I, i'm not sure what i'm not sure what the real answer is but um but the, the permit process itself, not the fees, is, 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 is an issue for sure. And Josh, you have a quick question. We're going to take a 10 minute break after this question. Just going to respond to Senator Clarkson in, in, you know, in her own backyard. She knows you know, Stratford Commons. You know, oh. That was delayed for years and years. And the delay cost an extra $2 million of public funds. But we were willing to take that risk. We were willing to hold on. If that was someone without those resources, that project wouldn't have happened. Right. And so that's the Absolutely. risk. Well, I, I get that risk for uh, public and supported housing. I just think that, uh, and absolutely, I get I get the risk. I just am, uh, was thinking on, on, on the more, uh, you know, less supported housing. I mean, you know, the less publicly financed housing that. Yeah, I mean, I can cite. The risk developers and developers all over the state that have said, hey, I started down this path of 10 units in Addison and here in this town and I got an appeal, I stopped the project because I don't have $100,000 in a year to wait. And it just doesn't happen. Right. And so right. the uncertainty is the risk and it kills the project. Right, yeah. so the risk yeah. is everything. It's time, it's money, it's permit, it's process. Okay, well, thank you. Everybody will come back at uh, 10.15.